Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Arizona Congressman Ruben Gallego discusses FAA flight path changes and other issues, and we'll learn about a clinical trial that's focused on a certain type of melanoma. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The U.S. Supreme Court today decided to hear another Arizona redistricting case. This one challenges state legislative boundaries drawn by Arizona's Independent Redistricting Commission. Nearly a dozen Republicans are claiming that the commission violated the one man, one vote rule by putting too many Republican voters into too few of districts, thus giving Democrats an unfair advantage. This all comes one day after the Supreme Court upheld the commission's authority to draw congressional districts. The Arizona Court of Appeals today ruled against Scottsdale's ban on sign walkers. The court ruled that Scottsdale could regulate sign walkers but could not override a recent state law that prohibits cities from banning the signs. Scottsdale is considering an appeal to the state Supreme Court. And the Gila River Indian community filed a lawsuit today challenging the South Mountain Freeway. The tribe claims that the proposed freeway would run through land that is sacred to the community. The lawsuit also claims that federal and state agencies violated the law by failing to consider the harm the freeway would cause to the environment and to historical and cultural resources. Arizona Congressman Ruben Gallego held a hearing last week on controversial flight path changes out of Sky Harbor. Here now to discuss that and other issues affecting his district is Congressman Ruben Gallego. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. You betcha. Thanks for being here. The, uh, the latest now with these flight path changes. What's going on? Well, nothing's changed. You know, people's uh, families and homes are still being harassed by low-flying planes. Uh, you know, it's impossible for a lot of our, our families living in these areas to sit outside and uh, enjoy time uh, with their neighbors. Uh, the FAA has largely been, uh, you know, irresponsible and non-responsive, uh, but we are pushing back. We had a great meeting of more than 200 people. Uh, we were giving them a legislative update on, on an amendment that I passed uh, to a transportation uh, bill. And, uh, you know, we're doubling down. The, the, a lot of the neighbors that have been affected by this are going to start pushing hard uh, on more of their elected officials uh, and on the FAA to, to have some, some way to rectify this problem. Talk about that bill, the amendment here. Uh, what, what's it call for? The, the amendment basically says that the FAA cannot redesign the, the metropolitan area flight patterns, which, you know, extend all the way down to Tucson, all the way out to the, the western and eastern border. Uh, without first dealing with the uh, Phoenix flight pattern. And the reason I did that is because knowing how irresponsive and bureaucratic the FAA has been, I did not want them to say, well, we can't change the Phoenix flight patterns because now we have redesigned the whole metro, it's called the Metroplex area, um, and doing that would, you know, would, would have irreparable harm. So if they want to actually continue forward uh, you know, with redesigning the whole metropolitan area when it comes to flight patterns, they first have to fix the Phoenix flight pattern problems. I was going to say, so this, does this, it, uh, it stops further changes, it stops these changes, it's retroactive and takes things back it's, to the way they were? It stops further changes. Now that's just the amendment that came out of the House. Now we need the Senate to act and actually, actually also introduce that same bill. So we're asking Senator McCain and Senator Flake to also introduce my amendment into the same transportation bill to make sure that it goes uh, into law. What kind of response are you getting so far? You know, we've asked uh, Senator Flake, uh, and we, we're, we've already sent some messages over to Senator McCain. Senator Flake, we've heard positive responses from. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from Senator McCain. The FAA says that this, this change is necessary to go from this ground to satellite based system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's necessary for safety. The airlines say it's necessary to cut costs. Uh, are they wrong? They're not wrong, but the question is, if you're going to do this, why did you have to do it in this manner? They, they should have gone through a public process to do this. They should have gone through an environmental process to make sure that this wasn't going to negatively impact uh, in, uh, in terms of noise pollution a lot of uh, families. Um, and also at the same time, just because it will save you money as an airline does not necessarily mean that we should approve it. Um, you know, this is a democratic society. Uh, people pay their taxes to the FAA, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, if if you know, change of the flight pattern saves them, a, you know, some money, but it affects millions of people's lives. We shouldn't approve it. So, but uh, speculation here. But if the FAA did come to the city and did go mm -hmm. to the residents and say, "Here, this is what we're planning on doing because we think this is it, it's it's more safe. It goes to the right. satellite system." Um, knowing what you know now, what, what what do you think would have been the right response? Well, I'd like to make correct one. They didn't go to residents. That is absolutely no. Incorrect. I'm saying if if they had, ah, okay, if they, they had, had, and knowing what you know now, right. 
Well, the response would have been stay, stay on the same flight pattern. You can still use the, uh, the new navigation system, but the flight pattern that is designed to save you as an airline money is not acceptable to the people that, have, uh, that live around Phoenix. We are one of the few downtown Phoenix airports that exists in the country. And there's a delicate balance that we have had for years to make sure that that continues. And that delicate balance was that we were willing to deal with a certain amount of noise, but we're not going to you know, hand over our whole lifestyle just to keep uh, you know, uh, uh, airlines uh, in, on, in the at least profitable by a, a couple of, uh, of cents per flight. Uh, that's not a balance, and there has to be a balance that's struck. And the, the balance that should be struck would be you could implement the, the reforms, but you're not going to be able to do it in this matter if it affects millions of people's livelihoods. The FAA, uh, some say they propose no meaningful changes. Others say they've had some ideas out there. What has been their response to this? Their changes have been you know, nearly ne negligible. Um, e enough to say that they uh, you know, tried something, but not enough to actually change uh, what is occurring in the neighborhoods. People tell me all the time, I see it all the time, I feel it myself once in a while, that those planes are really impacting people's lives on a daily basis, and their changes that they were recommending were basically cosmetic. How have those flight paths changed? What's going, I mean, what, what, what residents, what are they experiencing and what part of town? Because mm -hmm. most folks watching this, let's face it, they are not under that flight right. path. They weren't under the old one, they're not under the new one. Right. What's going on out there? Well, what's going on essentially, there are so many flyovers uh, in areas that are experienced and, and ready for this that people's houses are shaking. Uh, people aren't able to have conversations as much. You have people that have different types of ailments and illness, especially the elderly and even younger people that are you know, feeling harassed by these airlines. And essentially it's going over two areas. The flight pattern is going over two areas, straight uh, west into downtown uh, Phoenix and then curving into our historic, uh, what's called our historic neighborhoods, which is north of uh, Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, in between the 19th Avenue and, and we could go up, maybe go all the way up to uh, you know, 15th, 16th Street, and then going t down towards South Phoenix and Levine. Uh, and these are also his, you know, very big, dense neighborhoods of, of families that have been there for many years, and their ho houses and homes were never prepared for these types of, of low flying. Uh, uh, low flyovers uh, with a lot of noise. Residents that were in the old flight path, are they, uh, are they saying, well, you know, learn, yeah, to, learn to live with it, we have. Yeah, and some of them are, and you know, one of the things that is different is a lot of these uh, homes in the old flight paths uh, have been tempered against the noise. We as a city bought up uh, thousands of homes uh, to you know, help people move out of the flight paths. Uh, and even you know, what we're asking uh, for the FAA to do is not necessarily to go back to the same route, but at minimum, let's have a public process to see if there's anything we can do uh, that would, would exempt you know, us having to go back the same route. But we haven't seen that. There's no uh, openness to that whatsoever. So what's next in all this? The next thing that has to occur is that my amendment that I passed in the Congress needs to also pass in the Senate. And what I hope would happen is that the FAA would actually come and deal with us uh, and the city of Phoenix and you know, redesign the airspace as part of, as part of redesign the whole Metroplex process uh, through an open process with public hearings, with environmental impact statements, whatever it takes. Uh, and that way we can continue to move on and continue to have that balance we've always had between a downtown airport and a dense urban area. Uh, other issues, uh, I noticed that you were involved in helping support uh, Congressman Grijalva's bill to block that proposed mine, mm -hmm. copper mine near Superior. Absolutely. Explain, yeah. please. Well, a lot of it, it's more of the process, too. You know, I don't think that you should be able to wrap in uh, land transfer of millions of dollars uh, you know, that involve um, you know, tribal uh, spiritual land uh, in a process that was supposed to be with uh, the arm funding of the armed services. They have nothing to do uh, with each other. It's a, it's a particular earmark, uh, to be honest. Uh, and I think what they should have done is, is been more open about this and gone through the regular order for this and really give an opportunity for both the pro uh, uh, you know, mining community as well as the, uh, you know, the Apache uh, to have their opportunity at this too. So we have, you know, there's, it, it's in the open. This is a very non-transparent process that they went about, about and, you know, I don't think that uh, uh, copper mining has anything to do with defense, and that's exactly what they did. The Congressman Grijalva's bill blocks fed the federal land exchange, which basically allows this to happen. Um, and it also mentions that, you know, destroys sacred sites and environmental restrictions were bypassed and these sorts of things. Uh, for those who support the mine, and it's, there's bipartisan support Absolutely, in the delegation, yeah. uh, they're saying the jobs are there, uh, it will help a, a struggling area up there near Superior, and that the environmental impact is not that. I mean, we've got, we've, we've done a number of shows on this mm -hmm. here. We've got both sides of the story. Um, 
Why did you decide to go ahead and take this much effort into blocking? Well, and I don't disagree. There is a lot of jobs potentially that come from this, um, but there is something to be said about going through a, a process that has traditionally always been used. The fact that you had to go and put this in a defense appropriations bill, where you basically were forcing you know, Democrats and Republicans and the president to say either you're pro-defense or anti-defense, even though you were actually against the mine, really calls into the question why you have to do anything in the dark. You know, it calls to question the, the base, the base uh, idea. Um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of arguments uh, that are very positive for this mine, uh, but at the same time, if, if it's so positive, let's go through the normal order, uh, and at, at the end of the day, I think they, you know, things would have turned out better. But the fact that it was tied into an overall defense bill in the middle, you know, essentially in the middle of the night, not really in the middle of the night, but essentially in the, in the cover of, of this you know, amendment, uh, yeah, I think it's unfortunate. I don't think that's how you should do politics, and, and especially when you're transferring government land last into private hands. Last point on this, Senator McCain said that this is basically an effort by those who have always been and always will be against this mine. Mm -hmm. uh, are you included? Uh, I'm, a open, I'm here to argue for transparency, and I'm very shocked that anybody would argue that you know tucking something in uh, special legislation that's going to give property over to a private company uh, that's you know titled American land. Uh, is acceptably tied into a, a national defense authorization bill. Uh, that's not how we should be running government. Uh, and uh, you know, I would be probably okay with a lot of mines in this, in, in not just in this state, but in p other parts of the country, as long as I know we're following the pro an open and transparent process. But this did not go through an open, transparent process. Uh, you voted against a fast track trade authority and voted against a trade adjustment assistant mm -hmm. program. Both programs. Why? Uh, both were tied to each other. Um, I don't believe that any uh, Congress should give away its constitutional authority of, over oversight over any trade bill, especially to the executive, whether it's Obama, whether it's Clinton, whether it's Bush, whoever it is. Uh, Congress should not, be able, should not be giving its authority away. TPA gives the president a lot of negotiation power with, with the opportunity for me or any other member of Congress to introduce amendments, and that's not what I think our forefathers believed. TAA, the trade uh, adjustment, was basically a little gimme to, to get some Democrats to vote for it. But why would I want TAA if TPA doesn't exist? If TPA doesn't exist, then I don't need TAA. And lastly, the way they were funding TAA was by t stealing money out of Medicare. Uh, and using that to pay for, for workers. So it was a double whammy for a lot of workers. I was going to say, it, was it a double whammy for you, though? Are you against these bills as they stand or just against them because they were tied together? Uh, I'm uh, against them because they were tied together. There is no reason why TPA uh, needs to happen. We can have bilateral trade agreements. The president has the, uh, the power to do that. And if they, if, and I should have my say, and all members of Congress should have their say about that. Uh, TAA was just, an, an, again, another gimme, and I don't think... Uh, using uh, Medicare funds to pay for something uh, that's effectively going to end up hurting workers is, is a good idea. So when the president says that the, the, the fast track trade authority uh, gives the U.S. a foothold in emerging markets and that it helps diplomacy mm -hmm. in that part of the world which is increasingly dominated by China, uh, again, is he wrong? He is wrong, absolutely. Look, there's, there, the, the way to help the United States be, keep its dominant power is to have a strong middle class. And we're not going to sacrifice um, our position in the world uh, at the altar of a middle class or, or middle class families. That that's just ridiculous. Uh, two, the way that we continue growing uh, our alliances with uh, China is to, you know continue to have a very strong military. We cannot fund our military at this point because we have a dying middle class, uh, and shipping more jobs overseas is not going to help us continue to have that. And lastly, he can continue to have bilateral trade agreements. There's nothing that stops him from doing that, having bilateral trade agreements with Vietnam, with India, with whatever other countries he wants. But we need to have some, some type of oversight because this is our congressional authority that's been given to us you know, since the dawn of this country. Before you go, can't let you get out of here without some comments, quick comments if you could, about the Supreme Court actions here in the last few days. It's been a crazy <laughs> last few days. Uh, you know, I've been happy with most of the decisions, obviously. Um, specifically, same-sex marriage has been uh, something that we've been very happy about, especially in my district, and I think the, upholding the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. All right. It's good to see you again. Thanks good for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir.
TGEN and Mayo Clinic Arizona are launching a set of nationwide clinical trials focused on a particular and common form of melanoma. For more on the trials, we welcome TGEN President Jeffrey Trent and Dr. Alex Sekulich of Mayo Clinic. Good to have you both here. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, clinical trials on melanoma and a specific kind. Talk to us about this. Well, there's no question melanoma is one of the most difficult uh, cancers in part because of its incidence in a state like Arizona, but also in when it spreads across the body has been very difficult for us to deal with. As Dr. Sekulich can mention, uh, there's been remarkable progress in the last four or five years, but unfortunately it's still a really stubborn enemy no question. What makes it so difficult? Is it the way it spreads? Is it the speed at which it spreads? What's going on here? I would say both. Uh, it is one of the cancers that have been uh, synonymous with really aggressive clinical course, really poor outcomes for many, many, many decades. Uh, and as Dr. Trent mentioned, uh, advances that were made over the last five or ten years that are based primarily at under in understanding of uh, how the human genome is structured and how the cancer uh, misuses that information to its own advantage against the host have uh, fueled development of new therapies. Indeed, and now these clinical trials, is this immunotherapy we're talking about here that we'll be focused on or other aspects? That's a great question. Uh, this is really one of these genomic-enabled trials like the President's Precision Medicine trial in which uh, actually the patients who are entering onto this have all received an immune therapy or can't uh, receive one for some reason. And unfortunately, that subset of those patients have failed. And so this is a way to target the patient's genome, align it with a specific drug. Uh, and it's, a, again, as you said, a, a multi-site study across the nation. Tell us the difference between immunotherapy and targeting a specific gene or genome. Well. Dr. Sekulik is one of the really experts in the world in regards to this that combines studies on both, but our own immune system uh, really can broadly affect in a, in a very significant way uh, cancer cells and uh, the genetic information sort of pinpoints key Achilles heels that we can really take advantage of. Uh, please add, add to that because if people understand the genome and they know that there are certain markers out there that suggest maybe a predilection towards certain cancers or certain all sorts of things, um, but these folks have already tried immunotherapy and it doesn't work or it doesn't work as well as it should? So there are two, two concepts here, and uh, one is development of uh, therapies to things that are commonly seen in a cancer. So you can think of a cancer as a cell that goes rogue. It uses the information in the genome, which every cell in our body has, and it abuses that information to its own advantage. And it starts actually growing when it shouldn't grow, starts spreading when it shouldn't spread. Uh, understanding what genes are misused and targeting those genes, turning them off, uh, is what we call targeted therapy. That's one approach. The other approach is to say, can we enable immune system, our own immune system, to recognize better and eradicate the cancer. That would be immunotherapy. Uh, advances in both areas have been dramatic, uh, but not every patient benefits from those, either because they cannot receive those therapies, they don't apply to them, or they have not, their cancer has not responded to those therapies. And that's a significant proportion of patients. For a, for a cancer that doesn't respond to those therapies, what does that mean about the cancer? Well, it, uh, it means that uh, in that particular patient, it may not be just the cancer, it may be also the immune system that mm. may not be responding equally to these immunostimulatory drugs that we are uh, recently uh, starting to use. But in this particular population of patients, this is a population where there's no homogeneous one, what, what we call molecular driver. So the idea is that if you can look into the genome of the cancer in a given patient, you may identify what drives the cancer in their particular case and match a drug yes. that may work in that case, but maybe not be relevant to the next patient in the trial. Interesting. So it's basically personalizing that selection. Yeah, very focused. Okay, these clinical trials, how will yeah. they be conducted? So picture the FDA has approved this. We have a, a, a set of drugs that are sitting on the sidelines ready to use for these patients. We're capturing the most significant amount of genetic information that has ever been undertaken for this. And we're going to match those up to be able to give an individual patient a single drug that's pulled out of that that's tailored to their own genetic information. 
then we, we generate that information here at TGen, samples from Yale, samples from all three Mayo clinics uh, across the country, the samples come in, and then physicians uh, like Dr. Sekulik sit in a board and review the information and, and finalize that decision. And that's really how this process of this trial works. Now, are, are there some folks who will have this process and uh, some sort of other, you know, some guideline folks who don't have the process? I mean, obviously, is, is it blind? Is it double blind? How does, how does this work? That's a great question. We actually, this is a randomized trial from the FDA. Part of it would go on to a, what we call a standard of care arm, and part of it gets this investigational uh, information, and uh, we are able to combine the two. Uh, and that's uh, really a, a unique part of this trial. And I would imagine those who maybe don't have the particular targeted therapy in the first go around, if something is found, uh, they're still eligible, aren't they? Absolutely. So the patients can cross over, uh, so to speak, if a patient gets is randomized into a standard of care arm and they are not responding in the first uh, uh, period of, of evaluation, they are then crossed into their own molecularly informed therapy choice. When it comes to what we recognize as standard care, chemotherapy, radiation, these sorts of things, how does, I mean, are there still melanomas that respond better to those treatments than immunotherapy and genomic targeted therapy? It is possible, but the reason why we are all excited in melanoma, which actually is a poster child for other malignancies at this stage and in other cancers, why we're excited about these new treatments is because the old treatments did not work. Mm. And we, we would typically say in old treatments, we had to rely on statistics to tell us if something is working. And that's because the benefits were marginal, small. We needed to look at large numbers of patients to see a tiny, tiny little benefit. Uh, and these new therapies are really changing that. Much more dramatic, much faster responses. Yeah, we, we had the PBS series on cancer here not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And, and this, the, I, of, of everything that was shown, this immunotherapy, yes. uh, and we've, we've actually interviewed people who are, I mean, right. just amazing stories where they were right. just being, just crushed by chemo. They try immunotherapy, they're, a, they're not crushed, and B, they get better. I mean, th th it has to be optimistic out there. Oh, it's tremendously. It's probably the most exciting time, and the combination of these two are really what we believe are going to bring to bear, uh, hopefully, curative intent for some of these trials. So combining the immunotherapy, the very selected targeted therapies, which have less side effects than standard chemo, put that together in a framework that's tailored to an individual, and that's the great hope. You mentioned curative. Are we talking about cures here or are we talking about just being able to manage and treat the cancer? Now, in this trial, we're, we're really looking for uh, hopefully progression-free survival is one of the key things we're looking. How long can we keep the patient uh, doing well? Uh, cures is the long-term hope we yeah. all have. Yeah. Uh, side effects, immunotherapy, targeted gene genetic therapy, uh, uh, do we see many side effects here? depending on the drug and depending on the situation. So most of the immune targeted um, approaches uh, will have some side effects in terms of autoimmune type of profiles. But it is impressive to see that the newest ones are actually very benign in terms of side effects when you compare that to the benefit given uh, or received. When we look at targeted therapies, they also have side effects, so they're not without side mm -hmm. effects, but they, we don't see those broad uh, toxicities that are associated with chemotherapies. And, and Dr. Frank, I think it was mentioned earlier, the advances in, in treating melanoma are, are, are impressive and they're moving very fast. Why, why there, but we're not seeing the same things like in pancreatic cancer? Well, it's a great question. One is that the, the number of mutations in melanoma is the highest among almost any cancer we have of the 200 different types. Part of that is the sun beating down on us. And the immune system has many different sort of handles to latch onto. That's one of the reasons we think that this is the case. All right. Well, it's good to have you here. Congratulations on the trials. Good luck with the trials. And uh, thank you both for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we will talk about what it takes to be a foster parent. And we'll hear about an effort to help those with developmental disabilities. It's at 530 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.